and welcome to the cabaret of Dangerous Ideas here, broadcasting live at you from the Stand Comedy Club. We are in sealed room conditions, which is usually what they use on those films for those sexy scenes, but we are not doing that anyway. Intimate scenes at the moment for me involve a pack of mac a raincoat and two marigold gloves, so we're not doing that. So, welcome to the cabaret of Dangerous Ideas in conjunction with the Turing Institute. Big round of applause for the Turing Institute people! <laughs> Now, fabulous title, the Turing Institute. It's an amazing institute full of incredibly intelligent, wonderful, brilliant people, but it does also sound a little bit like the sort of people that Bond would infiltrate at some point to do something with a poison dart pen. But that's not what's happening this evening. Instead, we have three of their most fabulous fellows to come here and put a dangerous idea in front of you. My name is Susan Morris, and I am going to introduce you to these fabulous, fabulous academics who are going to introduce their dangerous idea to you. Now, the thing is, it's a cabaret of dangerous ideas. It's a two-way street. You can just sit there and enjoy the show. That's fine, that's cool. But it'd be much, much more fun to hear from you. As we put these dangerous ideas in front of you, we'd like to hear what your questions back to the academics are. Now, due to the wonderful, wonderful, wonderful world of the internet web, I believe young people call it, there's a thing called YouTube, and on that you can put a little chat question at the side, the little chat box at the bottom. You can also do reactions, you can do little clap things like that. You can put little thumbs up. Have fun with that little bar at the bottom, but we want to hear your questions. We'd love to hear your opinions. We'd love to hear what you've got to say about these dangerous ideas that we're suggesting to you. So by all means, fire those questions in. We want to hear them. Get on that chat box. Now, this is really exciting because we have dangerous ideas people all over the country. In fact, we've got one live here with us and we are going abroad, as we like to say, across the wall, yeah, into other bits of the UK for our other presenters. But our first presenter, well, I'm gonna to have to make this really clear to you because there's a possibility that she may offend anyone out there who owns a kangaroo. So <laughs> if that is the case, can I ask that you take the kangaroo to a place of safety, cover its ears, it may not want to hear what comes next because it's very aching and she's got some things to say about artificial intelligence and kangaroos. Let's hear from Vary. Hi, thank you. Yeah, I'm Vary. Um, for those of you who are wondering, that is Vary with an M, obviously. Um, yeah, because M H A I R I obviously spells Vary, though I am aware it also happens to spell mmm, hairy, wow. which is. <laughs> which is perhaps a topic for an entirely different kind of show. Um, I'm here tonight to discuss AI, artificial intelligence, uh, because I'm an ethics research fellow at the Alan Turing Institute, which means that in my work, I conduct research thinking about the, the impact that AI has in our lives as individuals and the impact that it has on society. And essentially, in my research, I am interested in how we can ensure that AI and, and new technologies have really positive impacts on society and avoiding or minimizing negative impacts and risks of new technologies. Um, and there's quite a lot of people working in this area, there's a lot of interest and in ethics around AI and a lot of people trying to kind of grapple with those really tricky questions of what we should and shouldn't do with new technologies such as AI. But I have some really good news tonight. I have a bit of a bombshell announcement that I'm really excited to make. Um, I found a solution. I found the solution to all of these questions, all the ethical dilemmas around new technologies, all the questions around what we should and shouldn't do. It's really, it's really amazing, I'm really excited about this. It could really transform the way we develop new technologies and even transform policy, regulation, everything. It's brilliant. And the solution is kangaroos, which I realize <laughs> might be a little bit surprising, and I realize that's a statement that probably needs a bit of explanation, a bit of context. Um, so to do that, I'm going to, I'm going to tell a story. And this story takes us all the way back to the year 2017, to a time before lockdowns, before furlough, um, all the way back to 2017. And it's a story about Volvo. So back in 2017, Volvo were developing an autonomous vehicle, a self-driving car. Um, self-driving cars use AI, they use artificial intelligence. It's artificial intelligence that, that tells the car what to do, how, how to operate out on the roads. Um, and in this case, Volvo were developing this autonomous vehicle, um, and it was performing very well out in road tests. The AI had been trained to do lots of different things. So it was trained to, to read road signs, to know how to, to respond to road signs. It could navigate roundabouts, it knew what to do, you know, when a red traffic light turned to a green light, a green light turned to a red light. It was trained to recognize if a pedestrian stepped out into the road and to know to stop, and it was trained to recognize if an animal stepped out into the road and to know to stop, and it was doing very well. 
but it was very good at recognizing Swedish animals. Volvo took the same car down to Australia to run some fervor road tests, and it failed spectacularly. Because while it was very good at recognizing if an elk stepped out into the road, or a moose stepped out into the road, it had no clue what to do when a kangaroo came hopping along the road. And I don't know, like, like fair play to the AI. Kangaroos are a pretty weird animal. So, you know, they jump up in the air and they look really far away and then they land on the ground and suddenly they look really close. And this, this AI, it just, it could not compute. It did not know what it was looking at. But, okay, so the message of this story is not, is not that kangaroos are weird. That's not, in fact, the message of this story. The message of this story is that the context in which a technology is developed is really important for how it functions. And there are certain assumptions, particularly with AI, there are certain assumptions about what an AI needs to know or what it needs to understand about the world in order to function properly in the world. And those assumptions reflect the priorities, reflect the interests of the individuals or organizations developing those technologies. So had this car been developed in Australia, they probably would have thought to teach it about kangaroos much sooner. And perhaps it wouldn't have been so good at recognizing elk or moose. And that's an analogy that can be applied to really all areas where AI is being developed and implemented, and implemented in ways that can affect our lives as individuals and affect our society. So for example, facial recognition technology, it's been proven time and time again that facial recognition technology is incredibly accurate if you happen to be a white man, but much less so if you happen to be black or if you happen to be female, and particularly if you happen to be a black female. And when you realize that um, around 80% of people working in roles developing AI, conducting research around AI, are male, and in the big tech firms, less than 10% of employees are black, then perhaps these kinds of findings are not so surprising. So, Okay, when we were developing this show tonight, I, we had to come up with, a, with a, a title for our talks. And I suggested the title of our talk was, the title of my talk for tonight was Watch Out for Kangaroos. And actually, that's not quite right. That's not really the sentiment that I want to convey tonight. Watch Out for Metaphorical Kangaroos kind of suggests that the role of ethics and AI is to kind of avoid too much carnage, like avoid too much roadkill along the way. The kangaroos are sort of an, an obstacle along the, uh, in the way of innovation or progress. And that's not quite right. When we're thinking about ethics and AI, we need to do much more than just think about avoiding harm or avoiding kind of, yeah, collisions. Uh, and we need to think much more about how we can actually do good and how we can maximize the value of these technologies. So we shouldn't just be watching out for kangaroos. We need to think about how we can get more kangaroos actually into the processes of developing technologies and and scrutinizing the role that those technologies are informing decision making about the, the role that those technologies play in our lives. So I realize it's a bit last minute, but I'd like to change the title of my talk. I, it's, it's no longer Watch Out for Kangaroos. The title of this talk is, in fact, Let's Get Kangaroos Developing AI. Thank you. Right, thank you very much, Barry. First of all, uh, changing title halfway through, no, not allowed, not allowed. You know, I'm a woman of a very small brain and I can't handle <laughs> sudden changes like that. Good Lord, that's just too much for me to cope with. So just, I just want to ask a quick question because I'm no great friend of kangaroos, actually, because um, they frighten me slightly and I've got very bad memories of Skippy, the bush kangaroo, when I was a child. Do you, do you, you would remember? Before my time, Susan. Uh -huh. Do you want me to clap them and slap you? Because I'm not <laughs> sure that the, the rules around social distancing can be bent, you know. But why didn't... I mean, an elk is one thing. Got that, right? But a kangaroo is basically just kind of like the same size. I'm not obviously the shape, but the same size as an elk. So why couldn't it see it? I think it was to do with the movement. So they're trained to recognise animals that move at a kind of steady pace or that are sort of that kind of look the same as they continue to walk along the side of the road or cross the road, whereas kangaroos are kind of erratic in their movement and they're kind of an odd shape and they, they don't walk, they, they jump. So I think it was to do with that. Um, yeah, that... The point was not that kangaroos are weird, but you're pushing me to say that, yes, in fact, kangaroos, well, kangaroos are, are weird. kind of weird. Yeah, oh, no, that's fine. I'm, I'm cool with that. That's okay. <laughs> kangaroos are weird. Um, and, of course, I've got issues with if you want to put kangaroos into the development process. I mean, well, I mean, the offices are going to have to change, aren't they? I mean, just to take account of these things leaping around. Yeah, and this is... Okay, this is... We're going to stretch this metaphor a bit too far, I think. I but we'll... Think uh, yeah. See how, yes. So, yes, you're going to have to change it. And, and there's a lot of... Um, interest kind of in, in tech institutions and in, in tech organizations at the moment in around EDI, so equality, diversity and inclusion. And there's a lot of interest in that we the recognition that we need to increase kind of women in tech careers and we need to increase diversity across all kinds of um, characteristics. 
And there's a tendency to think, okay, how do we recruit more women or how do we recruit more ethnic minorities into roles within tech? Um, and that can t lead to a position where, you know, you, you, okay, so we might have a group of elk or moose up in Svalbard somewhere. Um, and they might say, you know, we want kangaroos to apply for these positions or we want to bring a kangaroo in to fulfill a position here at our desk in Svalbard. Um, but for that kangaroo filling that position, that's probably not a very enjoyable, pro uh, very enjoyable position to be in in Svalbard alone with all these elk and moose. And you have to think about, you know, to what extent is one kangaroo really going to be able to affect change in how an organization works or how an organization thinks, whether they're the only kangaroo in a room full of elk and moose. Uh -huh. um, you're following the, yeah, <laughs> the metaphor. Is too far <laughs> because the problem is the recruitment for the very development is what you've just said. I mean, if the recognition systems were brilliant at spotting white men, because guess who designed it? I'm assuming, yeah? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and so we need to think much more than, it's not just about kind of opening the door and saying, okay, kangaroos, then you come. It's about thinking, well, what do we need to do to make this uh, more accommodating for kangaroos and to, and to really give kangaroos a voice in the process? And so maybe it's not about opening the doors to the office in Svalbard and welcoming kangaroos if they can find the way there. Uh -huh. It's maybe more about taking uh, some elk and some moose round to, to Australia <laughs> and sending them out into communities and into places in Australia to speak to kangaroos where the kangaroos are and just speak to them about, well, you know, how does this technology affect your life? How does it relate to your life? And, and what, how could we make this better for well, actually, kangaroos? The, our questions come in on that, saying, how can institutes like the Turing, mm -hmm, bit of product placement there, how can institutes like the Turing make data science and AL more accessible for kangaroos? Now, that's a very good point, because your kangaroo finds it difficult to operate a smartphone. It's the fingers. Mm. They do, and there's a lot of presumptions about digital literacy, um, and, and that digital literacy is, is not something that is uh, strong among kangaroos. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> change that, obviously. <laughs> but yeah, so we need to think of it. And this is partly about getting uh, more diversity within people working in STEM, so in science, technology, engineering, and maths, and getting more diversity in people working in those areas. But it's also about opening opportunity, opportunities for people from different backgrounds and different experiences in different communities to, to play a role in informing decision-making, informing development processes, science processes. And so some of that is, is not so much about, I mean, it's partly about careers and get people to work in these areas, but it's also partly about finding ways to involve people from different backgrounds in processes, or in, in design processes, development processes, and in thinking about policy and, and the future role of these technologies. And that's where the digital literacy is really important, because often there, there are kind of uh, activities or projects to to try and get, that open them up to get people involved, but don't necessarily think about to what extent everybody from different backgrounds is able to participate in the same ways. And so we need to really think about that. What, what do kangaroos need to, to become more involved in those processes? Mm. Well, uh, David Eng Englosol Englosio, sorry, I hope I pronounced that correctly, has actually asked, um, is AI actually biased intelligence then? So is AI actually BI, biased intelligence? Ooh. Um, I just thought of that, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so obviously bias is a really kind of hot topic in AI and ethics of AI. And there's a lot of interest in how we can address bias, how we can minimize bias within these technologies and, and, and yeah, in the, in the decisions that they lead to and how they shape services or how they, they, they impact people's lives. And there's a lot of attention when we think about bias, a lot of attention in the data. So is the data that feeds these, these tools, these algorithms, is the data bias and is that why the outcome leads to bias outcomes um, and actually I think this is where the kangaroo analogy is really important because it's not just about the data the data is one part of it but there are so many decisions about like which data do we use why do we choose some data and not others um, and for, so there's an example uh, of you may have seen there's these uh, tools that you can use on Facebook on the internet where you can get, put a picture of yourself uh, into this uh, thing and <laughs> it will turn your face into a, a renaissance style portrait um, and these things are often criticized because they tend to make everybody look white and people are pointed to this as saying what you know there's a clear bias here if everybody who gets turned into a painting ends up looking white uh, and people have said you know well that's because it's trained on paint renaissance style paintings european paintings which are typically depict white uh, characters in, in those portraits. And so there's a kind of a defense of like, well, this is about the, the, bi the data is biased. So if we train it on that data, we're going to get bias outcomes. It's going to make you all look white. But the, the bigger issue there is that, well, why do we think that that is, or why do developers think that that is 
sort of okay or that's acceptable. There, there, are, there are choices that we make around why Renaissance paintings, why don't we include a diverse set of data, why don't we look for terms, and why don't we identify those problems at an earlier stage and recognise that that's going to lead to different kind of outcomes. And that's an example which kind of feels sort of trivial, it doesn't matter too much, it doesn't affect people's lives too much, but it shows very clearly how these kinds of decisions and the decisions around the sorts of data that we're using lead to biased outcomes and, and they lead to different impacts on, on different groups or individuals. Um, and that is true, not just in examples of turning yourself into a portrait, um, but also in terms of how we access services, how AI has been uh, making predictions about uh, people who, who may need to access a particular service mm -hmm. or who are at risk of, of particular outcomes. Um, and it's, it's true of uh, uses of technology, such as facial recognition, in scanning faces in a crowd, deciding who gets stopped and searched by police, who is uh, considered uh, a, a suspicious character in, in a crowd. Uh, and again, these same kinds of inaccuracies or these same biases, which tend to, to make those technologies more reliable and more accurate if you're a white man, and much less so if you're black or female or black and female, that's really significant and it's really important uh, the, the impacts that these kinds of biases are having in our, in our daily lives. And, and just quickly, one, one last question for you. So this, does this mean that, that all the like, you know, huge scale medical modelling is biased and therefore not safe for some people? In, okay, so in sub, uh, and AI can do brilliant things in terms of uh, in, in the medical domain and, and it's going to be really, really important breakthroughs as kind of diagnostic tools and, uh, and, and you know, kind of speeding up or Im improving uh, diagnostic processes. So it can do really brilliant things. But yes, again, these same kind of concerns around is the data that we're training these models on accurate? Is it accurate for everybody? Um, and there's been uh, evidence to suggest that yes, in some cases it may not be taking account of, of data of, of everybody. And, that, and that's, really, that's really important and that's really significant. Um, and so, yeah, we need, to, we need to be clear about kind of what data we're using, what decisions are made about what data, and what, I guess, when we're thinking about accuracy, the ideas of what is good enough. So if we look at accuracy in a model and we say it's 90% accurate, well, maybe that's good enough. But if within that we find that it's, uh, I don't know, it's 99% accurate for, for white men and 20% accurate for black women, is that still good enough? Uh, I suspect probably not. No, it probably isn't. And I think that is illuminating and slightly terrifying, especially if you're a kangaroo. Thank you so much, Barry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>your questions coming in if you are a kangaroo get somebody to operate the smartphone for you that's fine um they can do facial recognition if you are in a big crowd of white men and you are a kangaroo they can spot you but that's huge big data now we've been told or about to be told that um size apparently doesn't matter and i'm saying that with a straight face <coughs> no i'm not <laughs> because I'm ca incapable of doing such a thing. Now we're, we're going through the magic of the ether now to the fabulous Professor Arat Banseri. Let's hear what you've got to say about data. Hello, yes, I'm Anna Bassiri. I'm a professor of data science. And tonight I would like to talk about diversity and data. Very well linked what, to what previously we heard about that. Well, I want to talk about diversity and data, not just because I've got dark hair and funny accents, because it's good for everybody. So I'm going to argue that even if you want to have a better society, even if you are a white British male middle-aged person, you still benefit from having a more diverse data set in your AI. So I am a data scientist and I work with data to understand society, but I work with a very specific data type. I work with the data that we don't have. I work with missing data. I work with incomplete data, data of minority people that we don't know much about because what we don't know actually matters in terms of the society recognition. The reason that I got into this weird sort of data is well, basically, I wanted to be very different from other data scientists, but more importantly, is because there are a lot of aspects of our life that are actually dominated by the choice that minority make. So there are a lot of things that we do daily basis, majority of us do daily basis, but they are actually the choice of minority people. So let me give you some example, then you would see how the minority can actually change the lifestyle of majority, even in the democratic places. If you have a small kid, probably you have watched Frozen, the animation, a hundred times. 
it's not because everybody in your family actually love Frozen. It's basically because there is a little kid that would cry very loudly if you change the channel. For them, Frozen is very, very important. They don't let it go, ironically. But for you, it's just an animation. Okay, let's watch it over and over and over. You see, there is a minority that cannot really compromise, and there is a majority that is okay with the change. If you get on an airplane and there is one passenger who is allergic to nuts, only one passenger, the whole flight do not get the peanuts from cabin crew. That's not because everybody doesn't want it. Actually, probably the most everybody wants it. But for you, peanuts is just the snack, but for that person is the matter of life or death. So because the cost for that person is very high, we say, okay, that's fine. It doesn't matter. We just get a bit disappointed unless the purpose of your trip is actually getting that six peanuts on the flight. So, so I can go on and on about the example of why we watch certain movies on certain time of the day or why we all eat halal food, even though the minority is Muslim. But these are very limiting and quite destructive and negative. As a matter of fact, most of the time, the changes that minority make is very positive. Thanks to Rosa Park, who didn't give up her seat in front United States. No, she has stayed. We call these minority stubborn minority who do not give up because of a biological reason they cannot tolerate something. Maybe it is a religious reason. Maybe it is a cognitive reason, but they cannot really compromise. Not just they don't want to, they cannot really compromise. The cost is really high for them. And so majority would say, okay, I don't mind. It doesn't matter. We are flexible and they adopt. So that is why we have better a policy in terms of climate change. A lot of people went on the street in London and everywhere else. Well, I'm not supporting those rebellious action or I'm not commenting on that. So hopefully tomorrow headline is not democracy fails and Iranian says that. No, it's not that. All I'm trying to say is we've got a lot of positive action because there are some group of people who cannot really tolerate that. And if we want to make most of the society, if we want to make a better future, it's better to actually use those resources. A lot of things that we actually have today is because they started by some minority, by some stubborn minority, or at least they were promoted through those uh, activities like climate change. And sometimes we cannot really afford spending time to persuade everybody to persuade majority to get to an agreement, for example, for climate change. Well, what would happen if we leave it to the hand of democracy and majority agreement? Well, that would be a bit of time consuming. So we need to know that. So all I'm trying to say is the life that we have is the, the, the version that has been affected by a lot of decisions that those powerful minority make. So if we want to have a very good understanding of what is the need of those majority, what is the need of even that white British middle-aged person, still we need to understand what is the choice of those minority. Otherwise, whatever we design, whatever is our AI, that would be out of date in a few moments time because we don't know what would happen. We cannot really predict a very clear future. So I just wanted to say that, yes, of course, it is very important to understand majority. And that is what the whole data science and AI would do, because they want to provide a good service for majority of people that fit the best. But to me, yes, that's important. But more than size of the data, more than what most people want, diversity matters. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Anna. Um, just let me get this straight. Uh, so some, sometimes it's a good idea for the minority to uh, kick up a bit of a stink, right? And that makes life better for everybody else. Is that right? Yeah, but minority usually do not make that choice. It's just they cannot really do anything but that. For example, if you're a wheelchair user, mm -hmm. you cannot get on a bus like everybody else. So you have to say your 
need a bit louder because nobody else even understands. So the example that uh, Mary was saying was just, you know, they don't understand the need because they're not women. Um, so you need to say that a bit louder. So they improve things for people in this, but what about, what about those <clears throat> unfortunate minorities, and there are there those, who only want to make life better for themselves and they're, yeah. they're quite, and they're not really interested in other people. So how do we tell the difference between a benevolent minority and a malevolent majority minority? Uh, that, that's a very good point because, for example, we we hear that climate change is um, because of only 1% of business people who fly on business class and so on. So you see, the difference is stubborn minority cannot really, it's not that they want more, it's just they can't afford less. It, this is the difference. You, you, you basically cannot eat peanuts and just say, okay, I prefer not to eat peanuts. You, you may die. This is why we have um, under 30 in this country will have alternative vaccine. It's because there is a very small minority that get blood clot. And so it's better for them to have another alternative. It's just they can't biologically or religiously, or there is a really fundamental reason that they cannot really uh, do anything but that certain thing. But, but there are a lot of study that we, we, we are looking at, for example, what is the cost? Is it something that you really can do or you will benefit from? For example, if your kid is wanting something really expensive, like a car or so, well, you, you don't listen to that. It's not frozen anymore. So the cost need to be you know, justifiable to the flexibility of other people. So, so the, the difference is basically like that. What you want, how much you can actually compromise and how much the society is prepared to be flexible for. Right. Can I just point out that whenever my children wanted to watch a particular film over and over again, I just unplugged the TV. <laughs> there is no democracy in my house. Okay. <laughs> I pay the electricity bill. You're not watching it, it's as simple as that. But you also said that um, if you design things without taking into account these minorities, then basically you're going to be designing things that are going to be obsolete in a very short space of time. So would it not be a better idea for the designers of these things to go out and speak to these minorities in the first place? Exactly, yeah. That, that, that hidden that's data. Exactly, yeah, that, that's exactly the point, because if they just focus on the majority, even just the user. Just imagine I want to design an AI that serves um, a certain group of people like that white British middle-aged men. Uh, I still need to go and talk to those minority because the choices that white British middle-aged men make is a function of those sort of changes that is because of the, those minorities. So they need to be a part of that. And um, even that person who is going to use that is going to actually benefit from it because their AI would and their model, everything within that would work for a longer period of time because the whole prediction is based on a wider picture. So yes, absolutely, that's the whole message. But, but the problem, perhaps problem is, how do you find them? I mean, you, we keep going about, White, what we need here is an acronym, right? White, middle-aged British men. And we know about them because they're the ones that are in positions of power. They're the ones that are doing all the hiring and the firing, as Vary said. And even the young British men right, are doing all the designing. So what do you do? What do, you, do you design a process where you enforce people to go out and talk to minorities? Is, is that how you do it? Well, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's the tricky bit. As I said, I work with those sort of data that doesn't have a lot of information about the minority. And I try to actually get to that. A part of it is, yes, you need to actually forcefully look for those people and make the whole thing better for them. Secondly, most of the time we get data because we have got mobile phone and so on. So if we design something that is acceptable for the population, for the wider range of population, they will use it and they will give us their opinion. For example, we say older people may prefer bigger font. If there is an app that is very small and even the fanciest version of that mobile app is going to be used by younger people, Older people cannot really comment on that because they, they're not going to use it. So we need to consider the whole diversity by the design from the day one to make sure that the data collection considers their concerns. Some people actually don't use mobile phone at all. So you actually have to design those sort of mobile like paper based survey and actually go to them. So that, that's the whole thing. Yeah. 
paper, paper. I know, I know. <laughs> that, 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 that's so tra- old fashioned, but you know, that, that's the way. <laughs> paper could be making a comeback. How marvelous would that be? But there's another problem. I mean, you're going out there and you're trying to find people to make the world better for them. But it's the people who are making the, the products, who are designing the processes, who are creating the services. They're the ones that you have to reach. And they don't seem to be engaging with this process at all right now because they don't see a benefit. Can you tell these people they'll sell more cars or more ready meals if they make them more accessible to people who have got problems and issues diversity? Can you tell them that, that they'll make more oh, yeah. money? True, that, that, that's a, a very important point. First of all, if they consider those sort of bigger picture, what are the impact of minority on the majority, then their model, their app would last longer because they can predict the future better because they know that, okay, there are a lot of flight with a lot of people like this going on that. So probably you don't need that much of peanuts because this number of flights will go peanut free. So, so there is a better prediction. Um, and so your model, your AI, your product would be it, well available for more people for longer periods of time so you don't need to update them every day basis secondly and more importantly you're actually making something that is really adapted to the whole society so there are more people actually using it so it's not just that what british well we really need an acronym um that use that other people can also use that so it, it is actually widening your business so it, it does make more business sense for people to go out and, and find their problems, in a way. Yeah, true. Yeah, that, that's true. So, um, like, um, found the problem and also get some feedback from the society. So we always say that the design is a very recursive process and we need to understand that. But there is also an element of, you know, how those minorities are distributed. You know, if you have a nursery full of kids, you don't feel that they are actually dominating their opinion to majority. No, all of them are happy with watching Frozen because everybody is in one place. If there is one kid in each house, everybody in the whole city is watching Frozen. So, so Frozen would make a lot of money if they are distributed all around the places. So what we are doing uh, at the moment um, is looking at how these minority who are going to have a big impact on the life of majority are distributed and well how, how we can actually get to them it's much easier if they are in one place but that that's definition of segregation we don't want that happen <laughs> so is that why people like well actually what you're talking about to me reminds me of the suffragettes um, they were people who hassled, who were destructive, who were loud, who were vocal, uh, who actually became violent in an effort to change things for the majority. And, and of course, they were ultimately successful. But um, it is that kind of person that you're talking about, is it? It's the, to make things change, is the noisy one. Yeah, I'm quite noisy I, if yeah, anybody wants me to be. Exactly, yeah, that, that's exactly one good example. So perhaps in next talk, I, I will use that. Um, so you see, there are um, some businesses that can go out just because there are some minorities trying to make some changes, you know, completely because they can't afford anything else. Um, for example, if you go back to that peanut example, if there is only one person on each flight, you know, at some point, uh, the airline decide that we don't need to buy peanut because there aren't any flight that we serve and they, the business of the peanut pro- producer would go out because there are a big market and you see you know what would happen so if there are very small minority that's you know they can have a very powerful uh say then there will be some changes that would result in some resistance so of course that would be a problem but the benefits of having more inclusive society more diverse society is much much bigger than that because Yes, of course, we will. We may lose a bit of the market of peanuts, but we are actually saving the life of a lot of other people. Yeah, uh, see, before you go any further, the only reason I do go on a plane is to get peanuts, because, I mean, <laughs> you've got to take your little perch where you can get them, right? So, let's just, like, so just finish. Oh, there's a question here. Uh, this is about uh, kangaroos. I'm getting shouted at from the side of the stage here, which is always exciting fun. What about the... Con- what? Oh, that's quite interesting, actually. Yes. So the kangaroos, apparently, I've just been informed, have, um, have jumped from, from Vary into your 
uh, presentation clearly. These, this is a minority that wants the issue settled and doesn't want to stay hidden. But what about the kangaroos who want to remain missing from the data set for privacy concerns? Good point. Oh, that's a really good question. Um, mm. First of all, I, I think kangaroos are always predictably unpredictable. So I, I, I should have expected this. <laughs> um, so yes, that's very, very important question. A huge amount of research that we do at the moment is about actually spotting those people. Just imagine if I come to everybody and ask, what is your income? Um, many people may actually say that, but the people who have got very high income or very low income, they say, prefer not to say. Hmm. So those prefer not to comment, prefer not to say. Um, those people are actually the one that has got some sort of interesting data in, in their mind. But, but of course, there are some people who do not want to say it because of the privacy or agency concern. And the good part about the statistic and data science is it doesn't work for individual. This is the whole mystery. We, whatever we say about, okay, minority can change majority, that's at much higher scale. I cannot say if I live beside a neighbor who is from, I don't know, a certain part of the world or speaks certain language, I'm going to speak language like that. No, it works on a society level. It doesn't work for individual level. So if people do not want to share their data because of privacy concern. I think the kangaroos have stepped in there. Some reason like income or tax evasion or you know those sort of things, then we, we are going to look for them. No, no, Christopher Burr has an explanation for the hiding kangaroos. He says, perhaps they fear the technology because it ran over their friends or family. And I think that's a very good reason for the kangaroos to remain totally hidden from sight there. I think we should have a huge round of applause there for Anna Bassini. Thank you so much. Thank you for hidden data and how it can change your life without realising. Thank you. Um, data is a big, big, big issue. These days, there's uh, there's been a lot of talk about it. Who gets it? Who manipulates it? Who changes it? Are you manipulated by it? Oh, John Crowcroft has got quite a lot to say about that. It used to be said how to make friends and influence people, but he knows friends who can influence your friends to influence people. So, ladies and gentlemen, get the little emoji claps going. Don't forget to ask your questions. Let's hear it for John Crowcroft. Good evening. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about picking friends that influence people. Um, my job title is a researcher at large at the Turing, and I'm also a guardian of the Matrix, um, which is a kind of part-time side job. Um, and uh, what I'm going to tell you about is that uh, Donald Trump basically wasted a lot of money on Cambridge Analytica. So I hope that people still remember who Donald Trump was. Um, Perhaps not. He he was at some point the uh, president of the US, um, uh, and then he lost an election. But the previous election was kind of interesting because they used a huge amount of technology to try to understand how social media would influence people uh, and influence their votes. And this goes back 16 years to work that we did uh, <coughs> in Cambridge, um, which was not Cambridge Analytica. We did not work for them at the time on social media. And I was interested in uh, how information spread um, through social media at the time. You know, there were things called MySpace, and then there was a thing called Facebook, and then there were lots of other social media. And we started to study how uh, information might go viral or not. And we talked to folks in the psychometrics department, uh, unit, because we thought it might be partly to do with the kind of people uh, that had a social media account, a presence. And some people might have different uh, a susceptibility to influencing other people. They might be more influencers or more influenced by other people, either direction. So uh, we, we wrote a little app that, uh, with permission, asked people a bunch of questions and then inferred what kind of personality they were in a very naive way. So they're curious, organized, outgoing, friendly, nervous, and so on. And then we looked at the information they would uh, follow and, and read and write and forward 
a retweet in Twitter terms uh, or mention and so on? Um, was it news or conspiracies or recipes or gardening uh, tips and so on? And uh, we kind of worked out that there did appear to be different behaviors of different kinds of people and also different kinds of information. There are also properties of people in social media um, that are not to do with their personality directly, or that they may be indirectly. So, for example, some people have gigantic numbers of followers. Uh, Stephen Fry, for example, a comedian, uh, has gigantic numbers, or Lady Gaga, or whoever. And other people have tiny, tiny numbers of friends. Um, also, they have very, not necessarily correlated with that, they have different rates of talking to people. Some people talk to a lot of people every day, and other people talk to the same one person many times a day, and other people hardly ever talk to anyone. So all these factors are interesting. So we looked at that, and then along came Cambridge Analytica, uh, which was some folks left uh, Cambridge from the Psychometrics Unit and set up this company, I think in St. Petersburg, and built uh, a commercial version of what we've been doing, and then marketed it to a political campaign as something we never thought of. We were just interested in how social media worked. Uh, they were interested in using it to do work for people for money. And various political organizations thought that this might be a way to uh, actually run their campaigns in this new wonderful online world that was there then. And so the question is, uh, was it worth the money they paid? And I'm going to suggest that it wasn't. And there's a couple of simple reasons why. Firstly, you really don't know um, how people vote. Uh, you, we have a statistics. Uh, you don't know how an individual voted. So you may have targeted some campaign at some people and they may afford it to a lot of people, but you don't know the outcome of that. So you, you literally don't know what, what, how much was it worth paying to get how many votes. Secondly, in the first Trump uh, successful election, the actual statistics of the votes were not significantly different versus Republican presidential votes. There wasn't a big change. So uh, frankly, you know, there is no evidence that it was worth paying any money whatsoever. Um, so then we were kind of interested by that, and I had a, a, some work with some students, and we looked at how uh, information was forwarded um, and what kind of things people posted. But then we asked them why. You know, why did you send that information on? And it turns out, you know what? People forward information to their mates because they're laughing at it. They think it's wrong or it's idiotic, or they forward it to their mates. They go, hmm, this is tricky. And what's a good argument against this? Because I disagree with it. And that's pretty subtle. It's really hard to determine what's happening there. And, and that's not obviously connected with the personalities of, you know, things going viral. Things go viral both because they're right and because they're wrong. And so, again, this is another example of how you really don't have a good idea of, you know, what, what would it be worth paying a company who would get the President Trump message across to a lot of people? Um, well, if they're mostly laughing at him, that's not really quite what he wanted. So... Um, so there's another thing I'm going to suggest about this, but just to just to, to, to fill in a bit of backstory, people thought this was a good idea because, of course, in advertising campaigns, any attention is a good thing. Um, attention, you know, gets people to look at things. But in advertising campaigns, when you advertise a product or a service, goods or whatever, uh, um, let's say in the middle of a World Cup soccer match, you take out, you know, a five-minute incredibly expensive advert. Why did somebody pay a lot of money? Well, because they actually knew the previous time they paid for that ad slot or somebody else did. They measured the increase in sales. And they measured the increase in sales for advertising in football versus rugby, uh, you know, they'd actually tell what their demographic or the kinds of people were influenced by that ad into spending money, which is a perfect test. It's not a secret ballot. It's a piece of information that tells you. And indeed, if, if they advertise uh, some product in a supermarket and they, you, they buy that and it's on their club card data, so you can even associate it directly with individuals as well as statistically. So, so there's a big difference between a political campaign and uh, advertising products where you know people might laugh at a product, but if they buy it, uh, maybe it's... Uh, um, a Bob Monkhouse videotape. Sorry, that's a very bad joke. Um, I'll shut up and not, I'll leave jokes to the experts. So, but the, the, the last thing I'm going to say, so I'm out of time now, really, um, is that actually Donald Trump and other people in other campaigns, political campaigns, using Cambridge Analytica style targeted campaigning may have actually done us a favor. They may have thrown their money down the toilet. Uh, from their own point of view. But from our point of view, they may have exposed lots of people to uh, rather coarse-grained political campaigning, and that has taught people to recognize that. Uh, 
And that then leads people to, to become more discerning. They use their judgment. They become more skeptical about things. And this is certainly the history of uh, advertising in many other forms of, of, of communication in mass media, originally in newspapers in the 19th century and radio in early 20th century and early TV in the 50s and 60s. There was a rapid descent, a race to the bottom in, in, in adverts because people became incredibly discerning and eventually would go away from any media that didn't provide a higher quality content without really annoying ads. Um, and if they're purely for campaign purposes, then you, you simply don't have a measure of what it was worth paying uh, for them anyway. So, so basically, from the beginning of end of my, uh, to the end of my argument, one, yes, Donald Trump almost certainly wasted all his money um, from his own point of view, um, even though he won the first election, but that wasn't because of that. There were many other reasons where political experts will explain why uh, uh, the other side didn't win um, and why they did the second time around. But also, he may have done us a favour and other organisations flooding the internet with dubious information, maybe doing us a favour, particularly when you look at uh, younger people who spend more of their lives exposed to social media. They are becoming uh, more subtle and nuanced about how they search out uh, more truthful information and are skeptical about the bad information that's out there. So um, so picking friends that influence people is actually a rather hard thing to do. And I think if you're Donald Trump, it's probably become close to impossible. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, John, so you're in charge of the Matrix. Um, actually, um, a guardian of the Matrix. Oh, the Matrix the is a startup. Of the Matrix. <laughs> this Matrix is a startup that does secure um, decentralised messaging. It's very cool. Started by students in Cambridge, and it's been around a while. And various governments are now using it because it's very secure. And they wanted somebody to keep an eye on their governance, and so they made me a guardian of the Matrix. And they came up with the job title, which is a very good joke. Although being a guardian of the galaxy would probably be more fun. Wait, wait, that is your job title. It's not a joke. I thought it was something to do with Keanu Reeves, that you actually no. are a guardian of the Matrix. Yes. Uh, I need to do something about my job title. I really need to do something about my job title. I want to be called the Grand High Battle Commander of the Tharg Invasion Fleet. <laughs> Excellent. Is that okay with everyone? Okay, cool. Um, so, John, wait a minute. Some of the things that you've just said are a bit, well, a bit um, startling because basically what you've said is you came up with the stuff for, that was the, the chassis for Cambridge Analytica and they took it and they did something so un-British, they made money out of it. And then, but in fact, it was money wasted. Yeah, I think, I, I mean, I, I can't prove that, but statistics don't lie. You know, it didn't make a significant difference in any of the places where their systems were used. Um, at the transition from what we did to what they did, I should make clear that we actually had ethics approval for what we did, and we did not get personal data out of the systems that we were looking at. We did the analysis online with informed consent from all the people. Cambridge Analytica actually also had informed consent. They paid people for the data and ex exported it from Facebook, and Facebook claimed they shouldn't have done that, although the fact that they could was a part of how Facebook works with a lot of its uh, businesses. Um, but their business, many of the Facebook businesses are advertising for goods and products, not for political campaigns. Of course, there is a lot of dodgy stuff on uh, social media that is political campaigning or hate speech or misinformation. And what I'm also claiming is that the, the more that we see that we're exposed to that daily, the more discerning we become, the more we, we uh, um, essentially internalize good models for judgment about what is a load of rubbish, <laughs> basically, <laughs> and what is possibly useful information. Just want to check with you very quickly, there is a load of rubbish a technical term that we can use safely when discussing the internet web? Well, the interweb is, is of course, um, a, a, you know, a famous source of very large amounts of rubbish and has been since you know, it started. But also it has useful gardening tips and recipes and, That's you know, which incredible things to clean the carpet when the cat gets unfortunate on it. Yeah, I, I can't be the only person who has a chewing gum on the carpet and gone straight to the old smartphone to find the way of getting it out. Um, but also, nice to hear you doing that shout out to MySpace. There will be people out there going, mm, I wonder what that is, in which case you're all far too young to know what it was. Um, so I've got a question come in here. So are we lucky that COVID didn't strike in 2016 when people were more susceptible to nonsense on social media? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And certainly the various um, uh, 
COVID idiots or um, well, and of course the anti-vaxxers and 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 also doubters of the wisdom of lockdown and so on. Um, uh, some of them have some plausible arguments, um, and when you then see, I'm just thinking you're in Scotland, Devi Shrida, who's like one of the great people talking out about COVID, somebody sensible like that, who is an expert on public health, telling you what, it, what how it really is, and is a, you know, a person with credentials from a place, an institute with credentials, that offsets that. And I agree that uh, earlier on, when people were not so used to uh, discarding the, the foolish stuff, or finding good arguments against the half-baked things, uh, we might have been at higher risk. So that's a very interesting point, um, higher risk of people uh, following um, problematic um, stories. And, and to be fair, it's not always clear. You know, there are, there are arguments to be had on some of these things. They're not completely clear-cut. In fact, we heard earlier about risk of um, blood clotting in age groups and doing the statistics right. And that wasn't immediately apparent when they first found the cases. And it's taken a bit of explanation of the mechanism, the equivalent uh, allergic reaction, I think it is to heparin treatment, that somebody worked out, a UK um, woman scientist whose name escapes me, but that took a while. And so these things are subtle, they're not obvious. And the, those kinds of things that you have to tease out, the journalists are, have been quite careful at reporting it, thank God. Um, but social media is a mixed bag and, and finding uh, uh, the, the, the the good arguments, uh, the, the understandable arguments is also quite a tricky thing as well. But you did say that um, people saw through the stuff that they were being sent the, the, during the, especially go back to the Trump campaign, people saw through it or they thought it was silly or the, and they were just forwarding it because they thought it was a laugh. But you also suggested that people that the people who are putting this stuff out are becoming more sophisticated. Now we've already heard from from two people collecting data and AI that these things are learning all the time. Maybe not the businessmen who are running them, but the the machines seem to be learning all the time how to pick things up. So you saying that this um, twisted influence could become more subtle in future and harder to detect? Well, I think it, I think it, it, there already are campaigns that are run that are sophisticated that try to um, undermine irrational viewpoints um, in subtle ways and present mostly plausible alternatives. Um, but the interesting thing is that the wisdom of crowds, this old, old idea, turns out to be quite good at detecting this. Um, so the collection of people over a, a period of time will exercise their collective intelligence. And if you do that in an instant, they're more stupid than the stupidest person in the room. But if you do it over a period, it's sort of Delphi oracle kind of prediction. They become super accurate. And I think it's going to be a very long time before the sort of learning machines beats the collective intelligence of people looking at what's being said. There'll be somebody who comes out with the great argument about, oh, no, wait, the risk is, you know, if you think you're worried about blood clots, you know, you have 10 times, you have the risk of being struck by lightning 10 times this year is actually higher than getting a blood clot from AstraZeneca vaccine, right? And so you get some somebody, pers person like um, Spiegel Halter, who's a, a professor of risk, who's, who gives these lovely analogies. In fact, you're more likely to be in a car accident driving to be vaccinated than you are to have a blood clot. Of course, then you get to the separate risk groups and then it's a bit more subtle. Um, but the, but the, the sophisticated campaigning it's interesting because I suspect that uh, to have a sophisticated campaign that persuades people, you actually have to have a persuasive story politically. Uh, so if you're, if, if at the bottom of your actual political story, you have some nonsense where the economics don't actually work, then in the end, no amount of, no amount of campaigning is going to fix the fact somebody will say, well, you said that, but actually what you're going to do is this, and that doesn't work. Well, there's a question here from Richard Clegg. That's a very good question. Um, is it our ethical duty to fleece more money from right-wing political parties using our social network expertise? <laughs> That's unethical. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I love, it's, a, it's a lovely idea, but uh, I, I, I don't think, and I don't think we need to. I think it's very tricky. It, it actually does lead to the question of should you take money from some companies who are clearly generally behaving unethically? And there have been some conferences um, that get sponsorship from companies that have now started rejecting uh, sponsorship from companies that behave in an uneth unethical way. Uh, it's tricky because the, there may be large parts of the company are just fine. And, it, you know, it's, it's a mixed bag, you know, and deplatforming people in general 
across a whole organization because of some part of it its behavior i think is is also unethical so i think you have to be pretty cautious and clever about that um so do you have any would there be like two or three rules that you would apply to any post that you saw say on i don't know are you still on bebo well <laughs> I used to be on everything. I was on every social media platform I could get on. Um, <laughs> just, just because we were interested in how they worked, you know, in practice. It was hilarious. And I have friends, and, and um, there's a guy, um, Emiliano Di Cristoforo in, in UCL, who actually studies the really dodgy platforms like 4chan, you know, the whole QAnon stuff. Um, but, yeah, no, when I'm looking at something on a mainstream platform, um, normally – you see a, a news source if it's if it's talking about politics, and you know that they're more or less trustworthy news sources. But also, you can go and look at equivalently trustworthy news sources. So, if you see something from, I don't want to get into specific examples, but you saw something from Fox, you know, you would take it with a pinch of salt. But you might not. It depends because famously, when we studied news reliability, there was a, a, a sports commentator at Fox who was very left leaning, but he was allowed to work at Fox because he was the most popular. Um, uh, baseball commentator in the world and I think it's baseball I'm trying to protect his anonymity but his politics were completely opposed but in the middle of tweeting about baseball he made some comment about politics which was diametrically opposed to what Fox would normally report and that's super interesting and people followed him and they did not troll him or were not rude to him about his politics because so they liked his baseball and they went oh that's interesting oh maybe i'll go and look at some other news source or washington post or something you know new york times or to, to get a feel for why did you say that that's kind of so and that's the kind of study you can look at but also that's what i would do i'd say oh wait a second that's that person says something that's a bit weird that's a bit off the wall let's go look at some other sources and kind of get a feel for if i'm interested because that half the time you know i don't want to follow baseball it's like following a world series what is that it's a it's a thing in baseball or guardian <laughs> of the matrix and um i don't know why the words be should be so funny to everybody or my what's wrong with you people haven't you heard of these things but very finally very very quickly um just before before we, we we say goodbye so you would suggest therefore that we we need to be digitally critical or literate when we see these things coming through yeah, and, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking from a, a data set of three people, which is my three kids who are like 23, 28, and 31, um, who are incredibly discerning online. And, and actually, all their friends are, they're critical, they look at other sources. Uh, they left all things like Facebook years ago. Uh, what, why would you stay on that? They said, and, you know, Instagram, you must be getting a bit old, Dad. Um, so... Um, yeah, but I, th I agree that this uh, literacy is the key thing. And the British government, DCMS, has been trying to get people to think about online harms. And uh, our response to them was, you know what? You know, just just give people a little bit of t extra teaching about being critical at school. Oh, but then they might not like the government. Oops. <gasps> but <laughs> oh. that will, you know, that's the single most powerful thing you can equip people with. Oh, we've suddenly become incredibly controversial. Oh, we're going to teach people to look more closely at what the government says and they might not like it, what they hear it. So, John, they're teaching you how to be a little more digitally critical, but what I think is really amusing is the fact that uh, he's called the Guardian of the Matrix, which is really cool. And secondly, nobody, I would imagine, has actually sat down, Donald Trump, and said, fella, you wasted your money because you just get a spray of Diet Coke all over you and nobody wants to get that out. It's a terrible stain. You can't shift it. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the cabaret of dangerous ideas here from the Stand Comedy Club here in Edinburgh. Thank you to our fabulous speakers. Big round of applause wherever you are. To our fabulous Valley, to Anna and to John. Can we also have a huge big round of applause for the fabulous people here at the Stand Comedy Club who put all the help all together. Not forgetting... The wonderful and the very long-suffering Al, who's standing behind all the equipment there, just, that, that was Al. He's never allowed to speak. He's never allowed to speak. Just give... That was a thunderous ovation there from the producer of the Cabaret Danger Society. Uh, my name has been Susan Morrison. There is one very quick question here. It's about kangaroos. Vary, just shout yes or no. Um, could kangaroos involved in the process perhaps result in developing autonomous bouncing shoes?
Absolutely. Let's work on that. Let's get those kangaroos signed up for the programme. Let's have those bouncing shoes. Thank you very much for joining us here at the Alan Turing Institute's Cabaret of Dangerous Ideas. And we do hope that we can one day do this live. Thank you for joining us. Good night. Bye. Downtown Gainesville, right there on Main Street, they sell fried pies, closed on Sunday. They used to have a circus here, acrobats and clowns, rebels and feats, closed on